Um, I welcome the opportunity to have organised uh, a CARE seminar with my colleagues who will speak later, um, and also to discuss some of the research which I've been doing over the years um, related to this topic of Brexit. Um, also, I need to acknowledge that this is generally an excellent um, series, the CARE seminar series. Um, and I think it's great to have the opportunity here to bring together academics, policy makers, MLAs, officials, etc., to discuss relevant research and how it relates to key policy challenges. Um, I say thanks for coming. Um, we've also got the topic of Brexit, a number of different dimensions we're going to be um, looking at. Um, before the talk, though, my talk, I'd just like to say a few comments on behalf of Lee, Cahill, and myself. Um, offered very much because of the nature of the topic we're dealing with and the particular context in which we find ourselves. Um, first point, generally, is that we clearly recognise that the seminar takes place at a time of increasing political debate in the UK on whether it should leave or remain in the EU. I'm going to stress, though, that the seminar is not designed to be an occasion for advancing the case for either the remain or the leave side. Rather, it is very much an occasion to reflect on research-informed perspectives on issues posed by the possibility of a UK decision to leave the European Union. Our second point I'd say is that um, what we're presenting is draws on extensive research undertaken in our respective fields um, and is informed by academic expertise developed during our careers studying various phenomena around the dynamics and effects of European integration. And I think thirdly, we'd also wish to make clear from the outset, partly because a number of us have faced these questions already, um, that the research which underpins our comments today has been undertaken over a considerable number of years and has been supported by a range of funders, uh, which includes Queen's, which includes the British Academy, which includes the European Commission, the EU's FP7 framework programme. It also includes the Economic and Social Research Council funded by the UK government. Um, the conclusions that we present today are our own, and they've been arrived at independently, and certainly independently of any views funders may or may not hold on this or indeed any other issue. Okay, so please bear that in mind. <laughs> right. Okay, I say I got the first que first uh, presentation as Ray indicated. It's on the issue of after the referendum, the UK as a member state with a special status or a new member in search of a relationship. What I want to do here is explore a number of questions raised by the prospects of both remain and leave. Essentially two questions. Um, the first, what would remain entail for the UK based on its existing relationship and the recently negotiated new settlement secured by the Prime Minister at the February European Council earlier this year? Secondly, what form of new relationships with the EU could the UK secure if it leaves? The presentation is based on two key areas of my own research activity over the years. Firstly, the process of treaty reform, uh, how the EU reforms its treaties and, its policy and their political and legal implications for the nature and st structure of the EU and what membership entails, both generally and for specific states with opt-outs, such as the UK. The second um, area of research activity on which this draws is work which I've done ever since my PhD days on the range of relationships that the EU can and has concluded with non-member states, particularly European non-member states, short of membership, and the principles that underpin those, whether those be relationships such as association, but also the principles that underpin membership. So I think if we were to understand the type of relationship which the UK may conclude if it were to vote to leave, then those principles will come into play. And we cannot ignore them in thinking about what type of relationship the UK will have. OK. So, first off, let's take the, the question of what membership would be like if the UK continues to be in the EU, if there is a vote on the 23rd of June to remain. If there is a remain, what implications will there be for the re in terms of the renegotiated terms of membership that David Cameron secured? What would that mean for the nature and substance of UK membership? And what sort of assessment can we offer 
of the New Deal, the new settlement that Cameron secured. Also, what sort of membership would this actually be? Do David Cameron's claims for a new settlement and the securing of a special status stand up to scrutiny? Will the UK simply be a normal membership member on the left, or will it go down the red carpet on the right and have a special membership, a special status within the EU? Okay. If we go back to the 2015 general election, um, that was fought by the Conservatives on the basis that if they were to gain power, they would hold a referendum before the end of 2017 and present the question of whether the UK should remain or leave the EU on the basis of a new settlement to be negotiated by the incoming government, to be based on Cameron's deal that was secured back in February this year. When Cameron set out to achieve that renegotiation, he did so with four sets of reforms in mind. We talk about the four baskets of reform. Economic governance, he had some ideas there. Competitiveness, sovereignty, and the increasingly um, contentious issue of migration. It was generally accepted that reforms that he achieved were rather meek compared to the calls which had previously been heard for issues such as the repatriation of power, demands for vetoes over further integration. One of the reasons why one could argue that what Cameron secured was relatively meek um, was because his ambitions were quite low. There's good reason for those ambitions to be low because in the process of reaching his four baskets, the UK had undertaken one of the most substantial ever reviews of membership undertaken in the European Union, the so-called Balance of Competences Review. Um, a very lengthy, detailed exercise, which basically concluded that the Balance of Competences was one which was acceptable to those who had participated in the review. That included government departments, that included businesses, that included academia, uh, wholesale representatives of civil society. There was also a second reason why I would argue Cameron's goals were quite limited, was that he had to acknowledge that he needed to be realistic, that the EU, as I'll come to later, is not a pick and choose exercise. It's a, it's a process, it's a membership, which is based on core principles and also negotiation. What though did Cameron actually secure? If we think back to February and the fairly detailed media coverage at the time, there are I'd say five basic sets of reforms um, which were negotiated. Um, as I said, arguably what was secured was much less than was actually anticipated. There is no four-year ban, for example, on access to welfare benefits for EU migrants. Um, there's no uh, abandonment of the phrase ever closer union in the EU treaties. What Cameron did get was an opt-out from ever closer union and indeed closer European integration in terms of treaty um, reform. Okay. One could argue that the UK, sorry, one could argue that uh, this was a reasonably significant concession. Why? Because the UK will have written into the treaties a direct exemption from ever closer union, and it will not be obliged to undertake further treaty-based in integration as far as further treaty change is concerned. That said, it does fall short of an actual veto over further treaty change. Um, the UK has accepted that the other member states may want to proceed with European integration, with deeper integration in a variety of areas. But on the other hand, it does raise the prospect that if there is further integration by other states, the UK will be able to secure an opt-out. I think that is reasonably significant. Secondly, um, with regard to the Eurozone, um, Cameron had fears that the Eurozone was going to um, be integrating and taking decisions without bearing in mind the implications of the rest of the EU and for the single market in particular. Um, what he secured was a formal um, respect being um, granted, or formal respect being pursued by both the Eurozone ins for the Eurozone outs 
and for the eurozone out, outs for the eurozone ins. Um, but basically, um, there would be, uh, in terms of the development of the uh, eurozone area, due consideration given to the functioning of the single market as a consequence. The UK, as with other eurozone non-member states, could refer matters to the European Council and therefore act as a temporary break on um, in integration until their issues have at least been heard, if not necessarily addressed. It's not a veto, but it is a formal mechanism in which concerns of Eurozone outs can be pursued. Third, we have probably the most infamous of the elements, and this is the temporary limit for seven years um, of imposing a f uh, limits on access to in-work benefits for EU migrants. Essentially, if the UK votes to remain in for the seven years, um, there will be the gradual introduction of access to in-work benefits for new EU migrants over four years. There will also be index linking of child benefit payments being repatriated to the countries from which the EU migrants come. Okay, this is not a ban on in-work um, benefits, welfare benefits for migrants. Um, it is a gradual introduction of them. Okay, so fall short of what Cameron actually originally envisaged, but nevertheless is a concession. Fourthly, we've got the whole competitiveness agenda. Um, here, Cameron arguing for far more uh, progress in exploiting the perceived potential of the single market, um, and that is to be written into uh, uh, various policies coming out of, of the, the Commission. I wouldn't say that's a particularly significant um, concession because much of the language of the Commission over the last five, ten years, indeed most of the Member States, has been around this competitiveness agenda. However, it's given greater profile by what Cameron um, secured. Finally, there's this notion of a red card for national parliaments. Um, basically, if national parliaments or a group of them have sufficient concerns that, um, and these are not addressed, then the council will not proceed with the legislation. It's a tightening up of existing mechanisms. Some change, therefore, um, yet these, I would say, are not sufficient for Cameron to make the claim that he has secured a special status for the UK if there is a Remain vote. Yet the argument, nevertheless, of a special status holds essentially because the UK already has a very substantial special status within the EU. Okay, why? Fairly straightforward to my mind. It has an opt-out from the single currency. It's an opt-out from Eurozone integration. It's not part of the um, Fiscal Compact Treaty, for example. Um, it has an opt-out from Schengen and the free movement of, of, of people arrangements in the Schengen area. It has an opt-out, opt-in arrangement with regard to police and judicial cooperation activities. And it also has some limited application of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And then when we look at the finances of the EU, it gets the budget rebate. Um, a rebate which is not share, not, uh, uh, of which no other member state is in a position to avail. Okay. This already exists. Um, and so, irrespective of what Cameron secured, um, there is a special status for the UK. That special status will, will very much be there if there is a Remain vote. I put this diagram up from a colleague at the LSE um, who's looked at the different elements of integration within the European Union, and as you can see from that, the UK at the bottom is in the outer circle because everybody else is doing more in terms of European integration than the UK. The UK has a very special status, opting out from a considerable range of, of activities. I'd also add that the special status is likely to be sustained essentially because the UK um, not only is in the new settlement is not bound up by ever closer union, but also because the European Union Act introduced in 2011 places a requirement on the future UK governments to put any, or any transfer of competence or power to the EU to a referendum. Okay, so there's significant controls over further integration. Okay, so there's some comments there on what if remain. If we have leave, this is where we enter the biggest unknown. Um, we simply do not know what nature a new relationship will have. Um, we do not know what will be sought by a UK government, either current government or future government. We do not know when it would be secured 
either. Because one thing we should note is that in terms of negotiating withdrawal from the EU, you have one process for withdrawal, and there's probably another process for actually negotiating a new relationship with the EU. That brings uncertainties in, in, into the equation. Now, in terms of the research I've been undertaking, I've been looking back at 50 years' worth of EU external relations, the relationships which the European Union has established primarily with European non-member states. And if we look at this history of integration, I say there are three key principles which run through the entirety of the EU's external relations, and which I would argue will inform, if not determine, quite significantly, what new relationship the UK can actually secure. I'll then also make a few points about um, some precedents um, and this idea of negotiating in shadows. First of the pre um, principles which I think we can identify in the development of the EU's external relations is that the EU always prioritises the internal over the external. The EU, put bluntly, comes first. The EU looks after its own interests before it addresses the interests of non-member states. Others wait. This in part reflects the power asymmetries there in terms of the markets. 450 million people, in the case of the UK, 60, 65 million as well. It's also, and I think this is something often uh, not picked up in a lot of um, commentary, is that there is a strong political will within the existing EU to safeguard the level of integration already achieved a reluctance to enter any external agreements which may put in jeopardy or raise questions about that, that, that internal integration. So the prioritisation um, issue. Secondly, there is a balance of rights and obligations. If you look at all the treaties which the EU has included with new member states, with non-member states, that it, there are different relationships it's established, it is very clear there has to be a balance. Negotiating with the EU is not like going into a restaurant and choosing a la carte. It is not a question of cherry picking. Essentially, there has to be a balance of rights and obligations. And the evidence is, from an EU perspective, that the stress is on the obligations as opposed to the rights. The obligations that non-member states assume are often greater than the rights they gain. A couple of examples, access to the single market for example, has not been granted to non-member states unless they've accepted the regulation that goes with it. Um, if you look at Norway in the European economic area, yes, it has access to the free movement of goods, services, capital and, and people, but it also adopts the entire European Union acquis body of law in relationship to the functioning of the single market. If you look at the recent free trade agreement that Ukraine signed with the EU, it runs to 906 pages and 486 articles. It is an immense document, partly because the sheer detail into which the EU and Ukraine have gone in terms of binding Ukraine into the regulation of the EU in order that it can have the access to the, um, the market. Okay. And there's no evidence, I would say, in the history of the EU's external relations to say that the EU is going to um, tip that balance towards rights. There's a strong balance there. Thirdly, decision-making autonomy. Um, essentially, the decision-making institutions of the European Union, indeed all its bodies, membership of that is restricted to members and members only. Even if you assume many of the obligations of membership in this balance under the second point, you do not get the right to participation in decision-making unless you actually sign up to members. At best, if you are a non-member state, you have consultation and decision shaping. And we also got legal evidence um, to support this argument of the decision-making autonomy of the EU. When the European Economic Area was first um, conceived in the early 1990s, there was a possibility of a, uh, an EEA court being set up. The establishment of a court which would have jurisdiction um, over the EU, other than the Court of Justice, was fundamentally rejected by the court in Luxembourg. And so even if there were an attempt to in provide some um, uh, involvement of the UK in the decision-making practices of the EU, the institutions, my argument is that would be open to legal challenge. Okay. Now, there is the argument that the UK is different, that it is, if it were to leave, 
or it would be an ex-member state. It would also be a large state. That may be true, but I would argue all the evidence from the nature of the relationships which the EU has established over the years suggests that these principles, which have become quite strongly embedded in the practice of EU external relations, would apply to the UK. My final slide um, comes to this issue of the shadows. Um, there is a tendency in a lot of the debate around the possible options for the UK if it were to leave, that it would be essentially a direct bilateral relationship with the, with the EU that would be negotiated. That tends to omit the fact that all types of relationship which the EU have established take place on the basis of negotiations which operate or which have been concluded in the shadows of the past, precedents in types of different agreements, presence of the shadow, who else is negotiating with the EU simultaneously, and the shadow of the future. What precedence is this setting for, the, for, the, for future relationships? I'll give you one example. Norway, Switzerland and Turkey will be watching very closely at any negotiation which the UK enters into with the EU if it leaves. Because whatever the UK gains will be something which is sought by Turkey, Norway and Switzerland, which given the current statements which have been put out by um, advocates of leave, that relationship could actually fall short of theirs. So if the UK is granted it, there's a very strong case for it to be granted to the other, the other states as well. And if it were granted, these principles, particularly the balance of rights and obligations, decision-making autonomy, could be undermined. So if the UK does leave and enters into a relationship with the e EU, negotiating that relationship will take place in the shadow of both past, present and future negotiations as well. Final comment I'd make is that all this obviously makes, raises the question of the, uh, or raises the fact that there's considerable uncertainty about what um, could actually come out of a relationship um, if there were a vote to leave. Now, chances are a, a, a decision would be reached, a new relationship would be established. However, I think in thinking about what that relationship might be, we need to be thinking beyond just what the, de the demanding state, the UK, would actually be seeking, but also understand what the practices, principles and precedents are underpinning the EU's position uh, were it to find itself in a position negotiating with the UK. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.